So you fantasy authors all know the drill. You've spent weeks, months, sometimes years developing your world, and now you really, really want to show it off. However, there's some uh, very famous authors out there, Gaiman, Jemison, and even Hemingway, who say you should only use about 10% of the details in the world itself. And so uh, how do you do this? When you want to show it off, you want to include the things, and you don't know what exactly you should do. And that brings us to purposeful world building, and it's a good rule of thumb to know what you should include and when you shouldn't. Uh, hi, I'm Matt, and uh, every so often I uh, demonstrate world building techniques, tricks, and tips, uh, sometimes by building world on the fly. And today we are going to be looking at purposeful world building and how it's a cornerstone of all your world building and storytelling fantasiness. So just this week, I was bragging to my writer friends about how I'd made it all the way until chapter six before I info dumped all the rules of the world in this little magical uh, urban fantasy that I've been working on for a while. And I was pretty proud of that, not ironically. And um, oddly enough, I did it as an info dump, which we've dis discussed before. Uh, please look it up if you have some time. And these are, you know, info dumps are something where you, you know, have a very large sum of information that you're getting across to the audience, sometimes through characters, sometimes just telling them directly. And it's really important to look at infodump equity. And, um, and I think personally that infodumps work really well for important stuff. These are core concepts of the stories, um, things that you need for them. Uh, but today we're going to be looking at more of the individual details, just regular details, the regular world building stuff, not the important, not, I mean, all of it's important, but the things uh, that aren't core to the story itself, uh, the little details details, little things that you need to scatter throughout. And um, here's my usual caveat. I don't know if it's usual, but uh, you know, you do you. Uh, you. This is your story. This is your world. You say all the things you want to. You want to spend several pages explaining the, you know, the culture of hobbits. You want to spend two chapters? Go for it. Tolkien did that, and he's still considered the greatest world builder of uh, all times, I think. Let's look at the, uh, let's look at the survey says. And um, yeah, you know, so you can do what you want. You can break the rules. This is not so much a rule as a guideline and something to consider for yourself when you are doing this. So back to the 10% uh, rule. Uh, this is, you know, the glacier school of, uh, of uh, rule building details. Uh, and this comes from a quote from Hemingway, which is, uh, let's see. And I am on the wrong page. All right, so back to the 10% uh, school of thought, and this is the uh, iceberg theory, glacier theory, uh, and it was developed by Hemingway, and it comes from this quote, which is uh, featured in my book here. Uh, da, 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 da. If a writer of prose knows enough of what he is writing about, uh, he may omit things that he knows and the reader, if the writer is writing true enough, will have a feeling of those things as strongly as though the writer had stated them. The dignity of movement of an iceberg is due to the only one eighth of it being above the water. A writer who omits things because he does not know them only makes hollow places in his writing. So yeah, Jimson, Gaiman, they uh, refer to this 10%, even though one eighth is, I think, 12%. Anyways, and yeah, the whole idea of that most of the stuff, most of your research, most of your thoughts and such are under the water. They do not make it into the story itself. Uh, I really think that you know 10% is arbitrary, as you know the Hemingway versus uh, Gaiman and Jimson. Um, but it is all kind of based on the idea of par being parsimonious. Uh, this is Chekhov's gun, which we've never discussed before. But the whole idea of you know if you're going to use a gun in the um, you know, in the finale has to be introduced in the first act. Uh, and this is kind of a misunderstood idea. I think maybe it's the reverse of that. If you're gonna introduce something, a gun in the first, that's what it is. If you introduce a gun in the first act, it's gonna have to go off in the finale. Um, really, this is more of the parsimonious of everything that goes into the story it needs to be used. And there's a good reason for this. Um, it's because you know you don't wanna inflict your suffering on, on uh, others. I mean, the whole idea is and so that's where the whole idea of being parsimonious part of it comes from um, and why it's difficult uh, because, you know, the idea is that you don't want to inflict your world building suffering on others. You spent all this time on the world. So, you know, you know, you've suffered, so they should suffer. The readers should. 
And I think it's actually the opposite. I think it's more of nerding out. Uh, personally speaking, I'm into cocktails and barbecue, so I can talk your ear off about where the Nick and Nora glass came from or the regional differences in sauces in the Carolinas. Um, and so it's because I'm interested in it, I want to voice this on everyone else and my poor friends who have to uh, endure it sometimes. Um, in world building terms, this is world building kudzu, as in you tell one interesting, interesting detail you like, but then that leads to another one, because then you want to explain that, and then you want to explain that, but then I need to tell you about that if I'm going to, the history of this, so that you can understand the you know, importance of that, and all of a sudden you've choked out the story with all of your world building details. Um, and kind of that, there's an irony to that, because the, um, as they point out, you can, uh, Wolf points out in his uh, textbook on world building, you know, a world can exist without a story, but a story cannot exist without a world. However, good world building makes the world has a sense of time and place that are independent of the story being told. However, that world was created to tell the story, so it all kind of loops back on itself. Um, and so, yeah, you've got to get all this across. You need to be complete, uh, complex, and the four C's of world building, and um, all this while having to create it all through details that you're funneling to the audience. So back to where we were it's at the beginning. How do we know which details to put in there? And that leads us back to the purposeful world building. Uh, and the three things to include, a reason to include a detail would be for plot, character, or the world. So this is all based on Terry Rosso and Ted Elliott. I think that's what it is. Might have those names back. Uh, they had a wonderful uh, blog post from the, the 90s called Death to the Reader, and it's great rules for writing in general. And I borrowed those in this book for the idea of purposeful world building. And uh, in those, you only uh, include it as detail in your screenplay. Screenplays are notoriously short, 110 pages at the most, so you have to, everything in there has to be important. And you only included details in it if it involved plot, characters, or was so funny that it just had to stay in there. Um, so we're taking that same kind of concept, switching up the, mutating the last one so that uh, it serves the world. And this is all important because of inside out processing. And this is what audiences do. Most authors look at if you're top down, bottom up, but we need to look at inside out processing, which we've done a video on before. And this is borrowed from RPGs. And the idea is that characters only care, the players only care about world building details so long as they pertain to that session that time. Um, you know, so like if, uh, you know, like I just want to go into the dungeon and kill some goblins. That's all I care about. Goblins are there. But the more time you spend in it, you're like, well, why are the goblins in this, uh, you know, in this dungeon? It's like, oh, they've been, you know, kicked out of the town. Like, well, why don't you go to the town? And like, why are they there? Well, oh, they're displaced because this kingdom over here has made goblins illegal. And you're like, oh, well, let's go to the kingdom and find out more. And it's, oh, really, it's a war of succession. And, you know, and it's being driven by two understandings of the gods that are, you know, playing into it. So we've expanded this based on the interest of the audience. Basically, the more time the audience spends in the world, the more they invested in the story and plot, the more world building details they will want. Uh, so, you know, instead of that goblin example, we didn't start with, well, the gods are at war, so this kingdom has a succession, so da da da, da da da, da da da. So that's why you're in this dungeon fighting goblins. We went the opposite route of you start with the goblins and you expand, you expand based upon the players slash readers' interest increasing over the course of the story. That's when the world building details go in. Um, so with inside out processing in mind, uh, please review the video if you'd like, uh, let's re-examine purposeful world building and look at our exemplars, which are Game of Thrones, Star Wars, Harry Potter, uh, Lord of the Rings, and Avatar Last Airbender. Um, caveat number the two, uh, this is more of a, a editing stage when we're looking at these things. Uh, when you're putting the words down on the page, as I am going through again right now, just Get them out, get the words out, put everything down you want to. Uh, you can decide if it's important or not later. And this is, again, editing phase or, you know, reading uh, when your readers are looking at it, to the early readers, that kind of thing. So this is what to consider, these purposeful world building, things to consider when you're cutting stuff. As does it need to, does it make that threshold of making it into the story itself? Uh, first one up is plot. And break these into three things. If there's, you know, the detail serves the main story, core concept, uh, a story arc or a scene slash set piece. Now, main story stuff uh, are the really like prime movers of the story it's, itself. You know, things that you need, uh, these are fantasy conceits, the things that make your world its world. Uh, you know, magic exists. Harry, you're a wizard, Harry, so you're going to Hogwarts. That's important. Seven Kingdoms, you know, you couldn't have a war of uh, seven kingdoms if there weren't seven kingdoms, you know, ruled by one king most recently. Um, you know, 
Sauron was defeated and there was one ring that's left behind that's kind of important for the story. Benders, you know, an airbender, uh, an evil empire for Star Wars. You know, these are the myths main story through lines, which we've discussed before. And, you know, story can't really exist without these details. Uh, they're often established in a prologue, which we'll get to another time. And they usually involve an info dump to get all of this across as in, you know, let's sit you down and like, this is the force. Like, oh, this is, you know, this is magic. And this is what Hogwarts is. Um, so yeah, core concepts, a lot of times info dump necessary for the story to take place. Uh, second one is a story arc, and this is kind of smaller, but there are things that are important to drive the story, not the through line, but for this part right here. And, you know, um, getting Harry recruited through the, all the owls and all that nonsense at the beginning, that kind of thing, or going to Diagon Alley to get all the stuff. You know, this is part of the adventure uh, du jour, which will lead into the longer through line, but is more, you know, truncated. Um, you know, learning what the king's hand is and that's why the you know the starks were recruited um you know the, the ring turns you invisible so that's why you're being haunt, hunted um ang wakes up you know that does kick the story into gear you know and he needs to be trained to become the avatar uh yeah what an avatar is being you know a main story arc something needs to you know, well you know each individual training section is you know its own story uh leia needs rescuing so then we're going to need to go to the death star and find out what the death star is um, world building details that are necessary for a portion of the star the story itself uh third one is the scenes or set pieces and these are Again, setting um, that are used for the story itself. Uh, Green Guts is Green Guts is a great example. Uh, you know, it's the the bank you can't break into. Now we have to break into it. Um, the Moon Door in um, in the Airy in uh, Game of Thrones is a great example. Um, you know, like well, we're gonna fight, and there's a big door that you're gonna fall out of. And it's interesting that the, it was not used as, in the book as a set piece, but it was in the the show. We should talk about it another time. Uh, Mines Moria, the big bridge, you know, the escape kind of thing. You need these, you know, set pieces for the story to you know exist in this one part. So even smaller section, not the story arc, but this one scene. Then we're gonna make this really really cool scene of. Gandalf falling off of a, you know, uh, off of a bridge, you know, second reason to include it would be character. <clears throat> and we've also broken, we, meaning me, have broken this down into three different types. Uh, your character concept, uh, the character's place in the world, and their individual relationship with it, which is to say contrast. Uh, for, you know, uh, in terms of major con... In terms of concept, the you know, most over, overriding, overarching uh, would be like the force. Uh, the you know, uh, wizards, magic exists. Uh, this is what house elves are. This is what a hobbit is, a maester versus the night watch, a bender. You know, these are things that are like core concept to the story itself. Uh, you can't have airbender without, you know, benders existing. So, um, so that's, you know, shows what the character is. Uh, the place, the character's place in the world, it would be like a Sith or a Jedi. Uh, the four wizard houses of, you know, Hufflepuff and Slytherin and all those other ones. Uh, the houses of Game of Thrones and their house words. Um, what type of bender you are and the philosophy that goes with that. Um, the kind of what you can expect from the characters themselves, um, you know, and it shows who they are, uh, you know. Um, we do not sew for the house words of the Kraken guys, whatever they were. Like, sums them up pretty well. We are raiders and we will always steal and take what we want. And the third one is contrast and look at how they are different from the things that they are supposed to be as in their place in the universe. Um, and Theon Greyjoy, a great example, you know, he was whatever the, uh, yeah, he's a great joy, but he was raised by Stark, so he is different from the rest of these. Uh, Katara being a waterbender in a place that doesn't have waterbenders is another great example. Tyrion as a not very good Lannister, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Luke and Harry as the farm boy who were not raised to be wizards or Jedis. Um, Aragorn being raised by elves instead of being the king that he's supposed to be. You know, these are the things that uh, you got to include these details, these world building details, because it affects the character in contrast to what you're expecting of them. And all the great characters are, you know, walking contrasts, in my opinion. Um, they are this, but that. And um, anyways, we should talk about that another time. But this is the way to do it. Include those details. Uh, a lot of times upbringing, that sort of thing, how they're different. 
All right, so the third time to use world building details is to serve the world itself. And this is the trickiest one because it's the most subjective. Um, the other two are necessary. Like, you know, you can't have, you know, that wonderful scene with the bridge and Gandalf falling off it without the bridge. You know, you can't um, have the story without the force. So you have to incorporate these things. So you know that it has to serve the world or it has to serve the character or, or the plot. Um, yeah, but for the world, eh, do you really need to include it? You know, can you cut it down to the 10% that Hemingway or 12%, uh, you know, get, you know, can you cut it down? Is it absolutely necessary? Um, you know, and that's kind of the thing. Like you, you think, well, this is necessary. Like, is it? Cause anyways, so there's three things. So there's three ways to uh, look at it, three reasons to include uh, world building details to serve the world. Uh, and the first is toehold details, author authority is the second, and creating a sense of wonder or awe. Uh, in terms of toehold, I think we've talked about this before, uh, a toehold detail orients the audience to uh, the time period or analog culture and setting that you are borrowing from, from the real world. Uh, this is the little details in the beginning of like, oh, he put on his uh, scabbard and his katana was in there. You're like, okay, well, they we're taking from this time period, you know, ancient uh, Japan culture that we're uh, t borrowing from opposed to, you know, the loincloth and gradius and toga. And you're like, oh, okay. Okay, we're doing Roma, Roman stuff, you know. So that's the first reason to include it. And those are usually in the opening details, uh, the story, the urban fantasy I'm working on right now. You know, the first thing the kid's doing is putting his Jan Sport backpack on and going out into the Montana night. And you're like, okay, well, I know the time and place uh, that I am working with. Uh, audiences need that. It orients them. Very good reason to conclude your world building details. Uh, second is author authority. And author authority is that you can trust me as the author. This is my world. It is time to strut my stuff. Uh, I include this stuff so that you know that I know this world. And um, again, uh, very effective world building gives a sense of time and place that exist outside of the story. You think there are places that we've not encountered in the story out there somewhere. Meanwhile, you know, there was a history that was before the story started and it will culminate after the story is over. The world keeps going unless the world ends in your story itself. Um, and uh, that is, you know, some examples of this is the mention of the Clone Wars or the Kessel Run in the first Star Wars movie. Um, these are things that you're like, oh, well, there's a place called Kessel. Oh, there was wars before called the Clone Wars. Um, there's small details that hint at rather than explain things. They kind of open more questions than, uh, you know, the answer. And this is kind of a form of techno bevel, which is uh, used for a lot of times when characters come in. Star Trek is a great example where a character shows up and they, well, the da 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 coupling and da 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 and they just ramble off words that make no sense whatsoever. And this is to establish that their character knows these things. Audience doesn't need to, except for, except for to know that this character knows what they're talking about. And um, that's what you're doing as an author. So you're like, oh, the such and such region is the capital of such and such, and he's from there. So that's why his accent is this. It doesn't really pertain to the story, but it shows that you've thought about it as an author. It's a very short sentence that you can say something. Uh, in my uh, Funtlock Fantasy series, one of my favorite compliments was just like, I think he could tell me the regions that are best for growing wine in the story. Nothing to do with it, but I could. And it was great. And um, so, yeah, you include little details just to show that you've thought about this. You know what's going on. So you don't, you know, trust me. I know this world. Uh, it can backfire. I remember one time I had a screenplay, a science fiction screenplay, and, you know, it was like, oh, you know, and he's holding this uh, knife that's been, you know, uh, uh, sharpened to the molecular level. And the, the producer was like, how are you going to show that? And I'm like, well, it was just hyperbole to show that it's sharp, you know? And so, yeah. It can go over the top. People can think about it. Again, that's the subjectivity of it. Does the author need it? You know, does the audience understand it? So it's, you know, how well you executed that. Which brings us to our third and most subjective of it. Does it create a sense of wonder or awe? Um, fantasy is uh, speculative fiction. That means that you are doing something impossible. You are breaking the laws of nature as we know them and audiences are coming to it for that. They want to see the world, uh, the, the impossible made real to them. Um, fantasy uh, differs from horror in that regard and that fantasy creates a sense of wonder while horror breaks laws of you know, physics as we know it and uh, magic and all sorts of things like that and creates a sense of disease and you know, dis-ease and, uh, and horror terror, that kind of thing. Uh, so fantasy, by its definition, creates a sense of, well, 
fantasy makes a sense of wonder or awe. Um, these are in kind of like in uh, uh, the magic system, soft magic systems, uh, window dressing is in there, just little details to make you go, wow, that's really cool. I bring it up all the time, but like the, uh, the magic treats in Harry Potter and the frogs that jump and then the cards that move and like, that's really cute. That is so neat. I would love to see that and be a part of that. And that's why it's really great. Um, this is in the four C's of world building. This is C4, compelling, uh, just make it cool. The rule of cool from Sanderson's Four Laws. Uh, maybe there's a video up about that you should watch. Uh, but again, uh, this is most subjective. Uh, the most time for the audience to say, no, I don't think that was there. It should have been there. That was boring to me. You know, um, did these songs need to be in Lord of the Rings? Eh. You know, did, uh, did you need the Wampa to you know, loop to fight the Wampa or the Rancor, which we will return to in just a second. Did you need 150 pages of Quidditch for the cup going on? You know, uh, did, you know, do you need the gates of Ergonathoth, Ergonath, Ergonath, the Pillars of Kings and, um, in, in Lord of the Rings? Did you need to see those really cool statues? Uh, did you need all that TNA in Game of Thrones? Uh, well, did we move the story along? Not really. Did it show up the characters? Kinda, but you know, that's what the audience wanted and that's what the producers wanted to put in there, you know, so it went in there. Subjective, if it needed to be in there or not. Which brings me back to the whole idea of that this is for the editing phase. You know, put it in there if you think it needs to go in there, and then you can say, you know, with a, a critical eye later looking at it, or your editor or your alpha readers, and say, nope. Um, you know, and you can see that some things that did make it in there, you know, the uh, or didn't make it into the adaptations. Uh, Lord of the Rings starts with two chapters about hobbits, and they change that entirely for the very good movie, which I think is a little better. No offense, you know, they cut out. Babaldi, whatever his name is, uh, they cut the Quidditch scenes in the Triwizard Cup down to five, ten minutes of a very large portion of the book. And now that brings us back to the other part of what I'm taking from uh, Purposeful World Building was back from Terry Rossio's quote, um, you know, this should serve these three things, plot, character, and in our case, world, or Bet, you know, best case, it should serve all three of them. Uh, and that's why I mentioned the Rancor in uh, Return of the Jedi. Um, you know, it was a cool world building moment. There's this big old monster. We got to show off their, you know, special effects, which look dated now, but were really awesome at the time. But it also served the other purposes too. It showed progression for Luke. He had uh, become more powerful a Jedi. He could take this thing on pretty great. It also got Jabba so angry that he put them, you know, all three of them together, brought Luke, out, brought Ahana out, and it was like, we're going to execute them all at the same time so it moved the plot along. And it was awesome. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, let's oppose that to when he fought the Wampa and Empire Strikes Back, you know, then it was like, oh, kind of cool moment. There's monsters on this and it shows Luke progressing, progressing. Did it move the plot along? Not really, except maybe it showed Han's progression of like he's going back to save Luke though he did that in the last movie so you know and then there's the rumor that it was all about um, uh, Mark Hamill had messed up his face but if you look into that no it wasn't they had to put makeup on him so anyways um, so that was you know the Rancor I think it served all three uh, the Wampa I don't think it did but you know it did serve two so awesome so yeah keep all that in mind keep you know does the your world detail when you're editing world building detail does it serve the plot does it serve the characters does it serve the world itself? Is there any way you can get it to do multiple ones at once? And uh, yeah, so it's all about the execution. Consider it when you're editing. Um, I hope uh, if you're watching this, we've got a lot of new viewers lately. I hope you subscribe. Uh, we're going to tackle prologues next week and what makes a good prologue. And uh, with all that in mind, I hope you can, uh, I hope it helps you to build some better worlds.